Hey there, I'm Mike Rugnetta. This is Crash Course Theater, and today we're headed back to France. Hang on to your culturally appropriate headwear, because today there's gonna be murder, there's gonna be sexy times, there's gonna be tuberculosis. Rebels are gonna pee in the aisles. Au revoir neoclassicism. Don't let the minimal scene changes hit you on the way out. We'll be taking a quick look at French Romanticism before moving on to realism and then naturalism, which is a lot like realism, only more realer. Allons-y. Let's start with Victor Hugo, who you may know as the author of Les Miserables, the novel Les Miserables. But Hugo also wrote plays, and in 1827 he wrote Cromwell, which we now mostly know because of its awesome preface, in which Hugo argues that if you really want to show how grotesque, sublime, and weird life is, you can't play by the neoclassical rules. Let us tear down that old plasterwork that hides the facade of art, he writes. There are no rules, no models. Rather, there are no rules other than the general laws of nature. Nature, then. Nature and truth. But maybe not too much nature. Everyone knows that color and light are lost in a simple reflection, Hugo writes. The drama, therefore, must be a concentrating mirror, which, instead of weakening, concentrates and condenses the colored rays, which makes of a mere gleam a light, and of a light a flame. It's sort of like the old documentarian nugget about wanting to tell the truth, but you know, don't get bogged down in all the facts. He tried out these natural, but not too natural, ideas in his play Ernani, which premiered in 1830. Kind of like Le Cid with a sad ending, Ernani is the story of a noble outlaw and his noble non-outlaw girlfriend. It ends in a double suicide. But remember how Corneille was towing the neoclassical slash Académie Française line? Hugo was not into it. He mixed comedy and tragedy and flipped the bird to the unities of place and time. He was cool with the unity of action, though. And he was like, I'm gonna mess with your 12-syllable alexandrine and use words that have been considered beneath the dignity of tragedy. So how do you like me now? Still gonna write in verse, though, because I mean, you know, not a heathen. Hugo. So rebellious, but within reason. The play premiered in late February after weeks of editorials and counter-editorials about what a shock it would be. One paper announced there would be riots and death and a small civil war if Ernani went on. It went on, and there was a riot. A small and slightly gross one. Four hours before the performance, a large group of Hugo-supporting bohemians snuck into the theater, occupying the pit and the gallery. They snacked and drank and peed in the aisles, and when the upper-class patrons arrived for the show, they were not thrilled. The two groups spent most of the performance fighting each other, but then in the last act, when everything became very sad, the two groups settled down and wept together, and the play was a hit. Hugo hired a hundred people to come and applaud it every night, though, so that probably helped. Following Hugo, a few people half-heartedly attempted to make theater a little more like life. Mostly, they did this by moving popular theater away from grandiose, avalanche, heavy melodrama towards intimate, sofa-heavy melodrama. This form was perfected by Eugène Escriba in the Pièce Bien Fait, or the Well-Made Play, a five-act prose drama that hooks the audience with a series of discoveries, reversals, and recognitions before ultimately reaffirming nice, conservative bourgeois values. Scriba, who wrote nearly 400 plays, definitely wasn't interested in making the theater all that lifelike. He wrote, you go to theater not for instruction or correction, but for relaxation and amusement. Now what amuses you most is not truth, but fiction. The extraordinary, the romantic, that is what charms you. That is what one is eager to offer you. Scriba was incredibly popular, and so were his dramaturgical role crew, Georges Fedu and Victorian Sardou. Playwright George Bernard Shaw despised Sardou so much that he coined the term Sardoodledom to describe his plays. But other writers were starting to wonder if the well-made play could be made even better by being brought more in line with observable reality. 
And this is basically where we get theatrical realism. The term realism started popping up in France in the 1850s, and there was even a journal called Realisme. Theorists called for realistic situations, realistic characters, and realistic dialogue, even grammatically incorrect dialogue, a development which I am aghast about. Alexandre Dumas' fils, the son of Alexandre Dumas of Three Musketeers fame, was one of the first writers to shift the well-made play into an even more realistic social problem play. As Dumas wrote, invention does not exist for us. We have nothing to invent. We have only to look and remember, to feel, to coordinate and give back under a special form that which all the spectators should immediately remember to have felt or witnessed. But that special form thing is important. A true artist can't just reproduce life. He has to discover and to reveal to us that which we do not see in things we look at every day, Dumas wrote. Which all sounds great, but if you read Dumas' most famous play, La Dame a Camellias, with its courtesan with a heart of gold reforms her life and then dies of tuberculosis because it's easier to forgive a fallen woman when they're dead plot, you'll see that there's definitely some invention and some tear-jerking going on. I mean, I guess you can only rip so much from the headlines, you know? And even though realism was supposed to be a move away from the sensationalism and moralism of melodrama, well, there's still a lot of sensation. As we'll see in upcoming episodes, the problem with a lot of new artistic movements is that it's hard to be faithful to your theories and write plays that people want to see. The realistic movement coincides with a whole bunch of scientific discoveries and publications, notably Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. Artists were fascinated by this text and by what Darwin suggests about how heredity and environment come together to create character. In theater, the big-time early adopter of evolution was Emile Zola. Instead of the well-made play formula, Zola said that theater should use other formulas scientific formulas. This was naturalism. Theater, Zola thought, should be a laboratory of human life, with its experiments based not on the demands of plot, but on the inner conflicts of a group of characters. Each play should test a hypothesis, investigating what happens if you put these characters with these hereditary traits into this environment. Spoiler alert, nothing good. Naturalism does not include a lot of happy endings. Zola's plays were so intense that they were considered too radical for some former radicals. Victor Hugo's supporters came to boo them. You know how those earlier realists were like, we want the theater to be like life, but maybe not too much like life. Well, Zola was all, make it all the way like life, more life life to the max. In the preface to Therese Racan, the 1873 study of an adulterous couple that he adapted from his own novel, Zola wrote, I am waiting for the time to come when they will tell us no more incredible stories, when they will no longer spoil the effects of just observations by romantic incidents. I am waiting for them to abandon the cut and dried rules, the worked out formulas, the tears and cheap laughs. I am waiting, finally, until they return to the source of science and modern arts, to the study of nature, to the anatomy of man, to the painting of life in an exact reproduction more original and powerful than anyone has so far. Let's test out some of these ideas with Therese Rakan. I hope you brought your life jacket, Thought Bubble. Therese is a poor girl who lives with her aunt and her aunt's hypochondriac son, Camille. Therese is semi-forced to marry Camille, and the family moves to Paris. Then, one day, Camille brings home a work friend and artist, Laurent. And before you can say heredity and environment, Laurent and Therese start a torrid affair. But sneaking around is tough. So eventually they're like, hey, Camille, let's all go for a boat ride. Their plan is to drown Camille and then live happily ever after. But the drowning doesn't go so well. Camille bites Laurent and no one can find the body. And then the happily ever after doesn't go so well because after they get married, Laurent and Therese are tortured by guilt. They keep hallucinating that zombie Camille is actually in their bedroom, which really interferes with sexy time. Therese can't sleep, Laurent can't paint. They both go a little crazy. 
Teresa's aunt finds out about the murder, but she's had a couple of strokes and can only communicate with her eyes and one finger, so she does a lot of ominous staring. She tries to expose them, but fails. The pressure is so great that Therese decides to kill Laurent, and Laurent decides to kill Therese. Then they figure out that each is trying to kill the other, so they hug and cry and drink poison while the aunt watches. And probably does some pointing. Too real, Thought Bubble, or I guess not real, but natural? In some ways, Therese Rakan proves Zola's ideas pretty well. The murder occurs because of the kind of temperaments each character has and the opportunities that their environment provides. And there aren't a lot of cut and dried rules or cheap laughs. But okay, how real or natural is this play? Meh. Even Zola acknowledged that it had some problems. It's an incredible story. It's full of romantic incidents. It doesn't feel like an exact reproduction of my life, or probably your life. Hopefully, unless you've thrown yourself into a passionate affair and then drowned your husband. If this is a slice of life, it's a pretty lurid slice, and it actually looks a lot like a sad version of bourgeois melodrama. Realism, like melodrama, is one of those genres that's still very much with us today. In plays, in movies, on TV shows. Realism and naturalism promise us art that looks a lot like life, but it turns out that life isn't always so easy to stage. It's long, a lot of it is boring, and people normally get really miffed when you call intermission in the middle of it. And also, do not get me started on the costumes. Okay, actually, that's pretty good. This means that realistic art has to adopt its own less than exactingly realistic conventions. Maybe they're not as strict as neoclassicism, but they're definitely there. Like the way that opening scenes have to establish who all the characters are, or the way that a crisis has to be instigated and then resolved. And speaking of resolution, we're going to be staying in France for one more episode to take a look at a sea change in acting, and then the rise of the director. But until then, curtain. Crash Course Theatre is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. Head over to their channel to check out some of their shows like Braincraft. Braincraft is a show about psychology, neuroscience, and why we act the way we do. Crash Course Theatre is filmed in Indianapolis, Indiana, and is produced with the help of all of these very nice people. Our animation team is Thought Cafe. Crash Course exists thanks to the generous support of our patrons at Patreon. Thanks for watching.